Osterley is a, a wonderful National Trust property that is often, in fact typically, represented as being European in its appearance and neoclassical specifically. And yet, when one opens the doors to Osterley, one is immediately overwhelmed with the Asian material goods dating from the 18th century. It's also the case that Osterley was owned by a family in the 18th century who played key governance roles in the East India Company. When you walk around the house, you are surrounded by incredible objects from the East, from ivory junks to amazing porcelain parade jars. It's just, it's just fantastic. Um, and these have sort of perhaps faded a little into the background of what we expect from a country house interior. Um, to the 18th century eye, they would have been extraordinarily exotic and incredible objects to behold. The 18th century East India Company was set up to trade with Asia, controlled Britain's trade with Asia. Many of the items that were imported went into middling households, ultimately uh, working class households, tea, cotton textiles for example, saltpetre for gunpowder. At the same time, the company allowed its uh, captains and some of its senior staff to do what was called a private trade, which was to buy and sell things on commission uh, in, the, in, in the Indies and bring them back to the UK and almost certainly uh, the goods that we have here would have come back as private trade commissions. This service is quite unique because it has this powder blue border which we haven't seen on any other armorial services which have entered the UK. So it's a really unique and special service. During the 18th century and later 17th century, around 5,000 armorial services were commissioned in Canton for the English market. It's a very special commissioning process whereby coats of arms would be sent out on book plates over to Canton and then the finished product would return around three years later. So it was a very, very long process. So these were incredibly unique and status symbol pieces that really indicated both wealth and connection. What is really special about Australia is that there is a whole sort of connection to India there, uh, which can be picked up in its collection of textiles. This would have been brought into England between 1700 and 1730. That was the sort of heyday of Cambay embroidery. And so you get a really sort of intricate work of embroidery um, on a, normally a plain background. And if you looked at them from a distance, you would think they were painted on, but you have to go really close, up close to the textile to see that it's actually embroidered. Today we keep um, the fragments of this in our storeroom. You can see by just taking a look at, at some of the pieces here just how fragile it is. Um, so we keep it in sort of just to preserve it and to, to prevent it deteriorating further on exposure to light and, and other issues. At Osterley, these Indian textiles are somehow the remaining sort of evidence of the monopoly with the textile trade uh, that India and China had during that time and how sought after these textiles were by wealthy families um, in England. Um, do you think this is English Japaning or do you think this no, is... No, but I think this is like a... I think this, this bit. At, at the top. This lacquer like secretaire is attributed to Thomas Chippendale and we believe it entered the house in the 1770s. It's most likely, I think, with most of the pieces that are made as a piece of English furniture, that they're made from lacquer screens which are then cut up. And what's really interesting about this piece is this amalgamation of lacquer um, and then the upper level is actually Japani, which is the, Europe, the, the attempt by Europeans to kind of recreate this incredible shiny material in their own furniture. So this is a really interesting piece in that it is made from a kind of amalgamation of different things, but it's essentially attributed as an English piece, Chippendale, who's incredibly important to 18th century furniture and interior design. We can see the ways in which 
English households were able to kind of amalgamate these pieces into their own interiors and make them appropriate for their own interiors. We often think of our current era as the period in which globalization and Europe's relations with Asia have taken off. But actually we take a much longer view, looking at the ways in which houses in particular, country houses, suburban villas of the wealthy, which we now often think of as being quintessentially English, in fact were not just inflected with global material culture, but were fundamentally infused and subsidized by Europe's trade with Asia.